um, a song to tune us in. I'm going to introduce you, go over the news really quickly, and then we'll uh, talk about Labyrinth. Sounds good? Awesome. All righty. And go. <laughs> The words. Hello. Slap that baby. Make him free. Woo! Hello, <laughs> hello, hello, and welcome to the eighth episode of Live from Muppet Land. I hope it's actually the eighth. Last time I messed up the number, so we'll see. Um, today I am joined by uh, a very special guest. It is our very first ever fan artist. Uh, on this show, please welcome of Ko Makes Things, Christio. Did I, did I pronounce? Yes, I yes, you did. <laughs> yep. Nope. You're perfect. Hello, Christy. Tell everybody who you are. Oh gosh, um, I'm just a very strange lady who likes labyrinths, perhaps a little too much, and shows that love in very weird ways. Yes, you are a remarkable fan artist. Uh, I some of your recreations of um, pieces of the labyrinth set or props have just been fantastic. I also want to shout out your beautiful renditions of uh, Muppet characters in Disney movies. Uh, <laughs> your uh, oh god, what's his name? Link Hogfrog as Gaston is great, and uh, I believe didn't you do Tamanella as Ursula? <laughs> at one point. Yes, I did in in the uh the Little Mer Pig series that I was doing, Tamanella as Ursula. And I also I am currently working on a drawing with her as the fairy godmother in Cinderella. So I think I'm going to just try and shove Tamanella in as many of these Disney crossovers as I can. I, I think that's just a Muppet fan thing. We try to shove Tamanella of all characters into as many things as we possibly can. And for good reason. She's so fun. She deserves to be in more Muppet productions. I I mean, I don't know. First of all, I don't know who would own the copyright to Tamanella, if that would be Henson or Disney. Oh, yeah, true. I don't know who would perform Tamanella nowadays. I feel like Matt could do it. Yeah, maybe. I Any, anything to just to see her more of her again. Or, or we perform a seance and try to conjure up the soul of Jerry Jewel. I feel like that's just the better. <laughs> I mean, we'll give it our best try. Give it the old college try, right? Mm -hmm. What what items would we need to place on the summoning circle to try and make that happen? Um, uh, okay. A lock of his hair, a Muppet mm -hmm. script, and um, Jared Faircloth. <laughs> But we're, right. but we're not going to talk about Tamanella Grindelwald, sadly. Um, though we are here to talk, well, before we get into our main subject, time to talk about the news! I, I've said this every episode, I love that stupid Sesame Street news theme. It's so cheery. I wish that the real news made me feel that happy. You know, I said this literally on the last episode of this podcast. My local news station has a, like, cheesy 70s singer-songwriter song um, as their news theme. Ooh. <laughs> uh, it's stupid, but it's very delightful. <laughs> it sounds like it was written... It had to be written in like either the late sixties or early seventies. It's got like a Carpenter's Captain and Tennille vibe. Oh, that's amazing! I wonder how long they'll keep it going for. I mean, they've been using it for like feels like almost fifty years at this point. So, I mean, if they ever do change it, it'll be a huge tragedy. Oh my! Yeah, that would, there will be riots in the street. There'll be a national letter campaign. There'll be a boycott of the station. It'll all be crazy. <laughs> All organized by you? All Yes, organized by me and uh, uh, Jack Burns. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, not a lot of news um, today. Kind of more of a follow-up from last week's story. Um, because, here's the thing. I go months without 
putting an episode out of this podcast, right? And now I have two in one week. <laughs> Um, that's just how this works. So this time last week, me and JD Hansel were talking and what it broke the day before was the HBO Max news. Now what originally broke was the news that they'd be removing the not too late show with Elmo and select Sesame Street specials. Now at the time we did not know which Sesame Street specials would be removed. Uh, we now do know which ones were removed. Um, what was removed was four specials, including two, um, Elmo's Playdate specials, which were produced during COVID, and then two animated specials. One was a retelling of the classic story, The Monster at the End of This Book, and the other was the introduction special to Elmo's Dog Tango. Now, what was not taken down from HBO Max that we thought could be were two anti-racism specials they did, The Power of We and the other one I do not remember the name of, <laughs> which I feel really bad for not writing down or anything. Um, those were not cut, but the two COVID specials and the two animated specials were cut. What we didn't know at the time, and which has been the big story since then, was that also, with no warning, over 200 classic episodes of Sesame Street have been cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which just begs the question of why. That's, That's pretty much the entire question I have for not just this but all of the drama that's been going on at Warner Brothers Discovery the last couple weeks why <laughs> I I know for the animated shows that they have pulled that I've heard tale that it's apparently to do with residuals they yeah. you know if they keep them up on the streaming service they have to pay residuals and I guess they would rather get rid of them all than do that which I don't know if that maybe also applies to the does. Sesame Street episodes. Because here's the thing. They, at Warner Brothers Discovery, they treat animation and children's content pretty much the exact same. Mm-hmm. So if it's children content, it's basically animation. And so, yeah, I think it is pretty much the same. They just don't want to have to pay, you know, residuals. But yeah, how much money is Frank Oz making off of? a couple classic Sesame Street episodes being on HBO Max. I bet it's not a lot. <laughs> Give Frank uh, he deserves it. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's such a weird, weird thing. It just... I So I, I don't know what age you are, but I, I'm old enough to remember the days of Blockbuster and, and cable TV and if you had a show that you loved and you missed that week's episode, you had no idea when you were going to see that episode again, if ever. And if the show itself went off the air, you were stuck. And, and you got her- more for DVDs. Yeah. See, I'm not, I'm not, I'm in the age where like Blockbuster died when I was like 10 years old. <laughs> like I remember well, I guess I wasn't. Well, I was young. I was very young, but I do remember Blockbuster. And I'm more, more specifically, I remember going to Blockbuster and buying a bunch of DVDs the week my local one was closing. Yeah, yeah, same here. So I'm not old. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm young. I'll be honest. I'm young. I, I'm a legal adult. I'm 18, but I'm young. Mm-hmm. So I remember before streaming services. But only by a couple of years. Yeah. It, I mean, it sucked. I remember, again, like, there were, there were shows that I loved that, for whatever reason, you miss an episode, and then you're stuck waiting for it to come back in rotation. There were, were uh, multi-part episodes that I remember I never saw the conclusion of until I, I was an adult some 10, 15 years later, because I was finally able to Google it and find it on YouTube. And streaming, I think, has had such an impact on some of the the shows and, and such the animation, the stories we've been able to tell and how we've been able to move from, you know, the, the one plot per episode and now have these long expansive arcs going entire seasons and i really do wonder what's going to happen with streaming now because i feel like the bubble has burst a bit and, and and again for animation i it seems like it's a little unsafe right now to 
be an animated series on one of these streaming services because as we just saw the rug can get pulled under you and then what do these creators have to show of their work see what i hope happens of all this is that the rest of the big studios disney netflix sony all learn to never do this Mm because warner brothers it does not look good in two courts right now. One, in the court of public di- opinion, Warner Brothers has swept under the rug any other media fiasco in the history of entertainment. <laughs> this, <laughs> this does not look good on anybody at Warner Brothers. And people know that. And two, they lost $20 billion in market share in two weeks. Yeah. That- Hurts financially, especially since they lost twenty billion dollars. They were only trying to recuperate three billion dollars. So <laughs> that tells you how bad these business decisions are. They, these decisions are so bad they don't even have enough money to release their entire slate this year. They just push back a bunch of movies to next year. Be, um, but the only reason being they couldn't afford to release them in theaters right now. Wow, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, so. Not related to Muppets at all, but they had like two, three or four films that they were going to release in theaters this year for the rest of the year. And uh, most of that got pushed back to next year. Uh, and they're only releasing Black Adam and that Harry Styles, Florence Pugh movie in theaters because uh, they can only re- afford to release two right now. Wow. Mm-hmm. It's bad. It's really yeah. bad. Well, I mean, you reap what you sow, I guess. Don't mess with Elmo. Yeah. Elmo has connections. Elmo has connections. Big Bird has connections, okay? <laughs> I, who I really feel bad, I mean, obviously I feel bad for all the independent animators and stuff like that. I feel bad for Sesame Workshop, because this does not look good on their end either. Mm-hmm. Well, and from what I, I, so I don't know if I'm completely up to date on it, but they, they were being funded by HBO, right? And that's how they've been able to produce new episodes? They're not owned by HBO. That's a very specific thing. They are not oh. owned. Warner Brothers Discovery does not own Sesame Street. That okay. Said they fund Sesame Street. They give Sesame money to create these projects, including the main show, including all these specials and spin-off series and all that. Discovery funded that. Or so I should say Warner Brothers Discovery funded that. Because in today's political climate, there's not a lot of money being pushed towards public television. Mm-hmm. Sesame Street was just getting too expensive for the American government to fund. So they had to look for a new stream of revenue. And I believe their contract with Warner Brothers is up in two or three years. Um, so there's already, not rumor per se, but a lot of speculation going around of who is Warner Brothers going to try to seek funds to next. Mm -hmm. So, so Uh, no, you go. I'm sorry. No, I just wow. That's. I mean, it's strange to think about the possibility of there being no more Sesame Street purely because Mm -hmm. they can't get funding anymore. And me and JD Hansel were having a discussion about this last week, right? And he brought up some points that I disagreed and agreed with that maybe Sesame Street isn't quite needed anymore. Maybe it's kind of ran its course, which is hard to think about, but might be true. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. It just seems like it's such a shame. Yeah, it seems like Sesame Street should never be a show that should run its course, quote unquote. But like, I don't know, you know? But it's just a shame. Classic episodes got removed because, you know, and there is still Sesame Street on HBO Max. There's still over 300 episodes and there are Sesame Street episodes on YouTube. But these specific classic episodes, some of them are on YouTube, but even the ones that are on YouTube, they're not on there by Sesame. They're on there by people like you and me just uploading them. Hmm. And I think what was such a shame was that HBO Max was, for the first time in years, we had this big library of classic Sesame Street with the possibility that any episode could be added at any moment. And now that's all gone. Oh, man. 
streaming was once just the coolest thing ever. And like like I said earlier, I feel like the bubble has burst and now it's I don't know. We'll see how it goes, I guess. Yep. Well, that's my only real news story. Uh, Muppets Now uh, is, like we said last time, it's wrapped and it'll be coming out soon. Maybe. Who knows? Um, But I don't really have much news to talk about. But, (laughs) Christy, it is Mm -hmm. that correct? I'm going to call you Carrie at some point. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Christy, right? Yes. I have to ask you a question I've asked every single one of my guests. Mm-hmm. Christy. Yes. Who plays Jim in the biopic? Oh. Uh, would it be weird to get Brian to <laughs> Brian Henson to do it? That's that's a new one. <laughs> I've heard a lot of I've heard you know, I've heard a lot of weird things. I've heard the guy who played Neville in Harry Potter. I've heard John Krasinski. I've even heard have Steve Whitmire do the first half and Matt Vogel do the second. But oh. Brian Henson, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> I do not know how I feel about that. I guess that'd be a little weird. Yeah, I don't know. I... I mean, he would probably know him pretty well, I'm sure. Yeah. And I feel like if 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 the Jim Henson biopic ever does get made, which who knows if it ever actually will, um, I got a feeling to expect a Brian cameo or, you know, mm. something along those lines. I'm sure if there is a Henson biopic, the Henson family will be very much involved. I hope so. <laughs> or it'll be like that terrible David Bowie biopic where they couldn't even use the rights to his music or i was thinking about the yet to be released terrible billy joel biopic which has his um did not get his permission either oh god get here's a tip if you're doing a biopic on somebody get their permission or their family's permission please i do i do love that there's this emerging um emerging genre of biopics that can't use the music of the musicians they're portraying. That's funny. It is funny. What would be really funny, like they one of those happened and somebody wrote different songs with like the same title as all of the other songs. Oh. Or they did they had to do like a weird owl kind of parody <laughs> of them to try and get get I, something in the movie. Speaking of biopics, that the weird owl biopic comes out in a couple months. Oh yeah, Daniel Radcliffe is weird. Ass. <laughs> I'm I'm a, on top of being a huge Muppet fan. I'm also a huge Weird Al fan. So, oh, gotcha. A shame they never really worked together, but that's a whole different conversation. No, no. There's um, yeah. You'd be surprised. There was um a photo shoot for Muppet Magazine, but um, other than that, no. Huh. Yeah, not even like a Sesame Street appearance or something. It's oh, weird. wow. Yeah. Millie, hundreds of celebrities have worked with Muppets, but no Weird Al. It's so weird to me. Okay, I just thought of something. What? So, if you know anything about the history of the movie we're going to be discussing later, you know that David Bowie, you know, was just, eventually got the role, but there were several ma- m- mainstream pop stars that they had in consideration. Mm-hmm. What if Weird Al played Jerry? <laughs> oh God! Can you imagine it? I. <laughs> It'd be a very different feeling movie. That's for sure. Oh, now I, I'm just picturing him in the ballroom scene, ballroom scene dancing with Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? Do you think he would use a wig, or would he just have... Because Al, Al in the 80s, he still had his perm back then, right? Yeah, just like, he didn't have his straight hair. He had, like, the throwy perm, right? Yeah. And he still had the glasses, too. Yeah. And he had the mustache back then, right? Weird Al was a completely different looking person in 1988 compared to 2008. I'm just saying. <laughs> um... All I can think of is like 
the labyrinth songs that David Bowie wrote, but as polkas. Oh, I, you know what? The more we talk about this, the more I'm for it. As the world falls down, 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 down. Hey! <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. We need this. We the, need this to happen now. The, forget the sequel. Forget whatever spin off series or whatever. Remake Labyrinth with Weird Al. Yeah. Just like green screen him in. Keep everything oh, else the yeah. exact same. Get Connelly, still Sarah. Get. All the puppets back. Don't even recreate them. Just use the uh, original puppets, all decayed and. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Well, before we get into labyrinth, let's quickly talk about what we're not watching. Because <laughs> we had a poll, and instead of me pulling four random things from my random list of Henson content, I told us both to pick one thing, and to cover that. Right. <laughs> that's what we did right yes correct okay so you the two things you suggested were the movie we're watching today and the frog prince i assume you've seen the frog prince yes it is one of my very nostalgic jim henson favorites um that and Hey Cinderella, I just have a very special fondness for because I have just a lot of memories of watching them in my grandma's cold, dark basement. And I think those two specials, above all else, are what really planted the seed for me loving the Muppets from a young age. Yeah, I I don't think I've ever actually seen Hey Cinderella. Oh, no, Frog Prince. I've never seen the Frog Prince. I've seen Hey Cinderella. Um, oh, yeah, I think it's just, I don't know. I, I need to. I need to. I just, I've never really seen it. You should, you should do it. I, I find both of them really fascinating to see that, just the early beginnings of Jim mm -hmm. Henson. I mean, the frog, sorry, the frog prince, wait, no. Hey, Cinderella, I get them confused. Hey, Cinderella, <laughs> which I have seen, is very weird. Yeah. But very interesting. I kind of wish we were talking about the Frog Prince just because, you know, then we could chat about Tamanella all day. Mm -hmm. um, the two things I suggested first was Old Brown Ears is back. Are you familiar with Old Brown Ears? No. That, oh, that is a delight. You go listen to that after this. It's only half an hour. It was recorded in, I think, actually 1986 or 1987 and wasn't released until 1994. And it's an entire cover album of Jim Henson as Rolf the Dog. <laughs> and it's just, it's a bunch of Muppet Show songs. It's stuff like You and I were in George and New York State of Mind and The Garden Song and Lydia the Tattoo Lady and stuff like that. And it's just this really short, really nice kind of bluesy evening with Ralph. And it's just very good. And I kind of want to cover it because last week we covered a really bad Muppet record. Uh oh. Oh, have you ever listened to Kermit on Pigs? No. Don't. For so somehow, me and JD Hansel got two hours of content out of riffing Kermit on Pigs. I don't know <laughs> what we did. Oh no. It's very bad. Why did Why did you punish yourselves? Well, for that one, I pulled from a list of specifically obscure Muppet content, and that just happened to win the poll. Ah. I wanted to talk about Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue, but no, the voting public made me listen to Kermit the Frog sing She Drives Like Crazy. <laughs> oh, that's... Because Cartoon All-Stars is the one where they they talk yep. about weed, right? Yep, yep, that's Cartoon All-Stars. And people didn't vote for that? Wow. It got second. Okay. It got second, you know, it beat Lighthouse Island and... Um, I don't even remember what the fourth option was. <laughs> um, and then the final thing we're not talking about, uh, which actually came in second place today, was Muppet Classic Theater, which I only put on here because I had recently seen it. And it's very cute. It's very cute. I haven't seen that one all the way through, but I've seen a few of the segments and it is pretty adorable. It's cute. It's not the best thing they ever did, but it's a watch. It's pretty good. I, I haven't seen it. 
That one I'm almost surprised I didn't see as a kid because it feels like it would have fit right in with the Frog Prince and Hey Cinderella. Especially since it is the Muppets doing a bunch of classic fairy tales, you know? It's them doing uh, The Emperor's New Clothes and Rumpelstiltskin and stuff like that. And it fits in with all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But today we are covering a very obscure (laughs) Henson product. I kid, I kid. Uh, we are covering one of the few movies that I have its poster hanging on my bedroom wall. Christy, what are we covering? We are covering Labyrinth. Labyrinth. Oh, I don't. Here's the thing. I don't <laughs> quite know how to discuss this movie. No. Nope. Just. It's. I feel bad criticizing it. And I feel like when we discuss this movie, we're going to break it down, right? But Mm -hmm. I feel like when I discuss this movie with you, it's going to sound like I'm more negative than I actually am. Oh, yeah, that's no, that's, I, sometimes people think that criticism equals negativity, but that's not the case. It's sometimes it's, it's often born out of a love for whatever media you're consuming and just that you just have some thoughts and feelings on it and you want to share it. So yeah, I guess I'll, I'll join in on that. Like I love this movie very dearly. You know, there might be some pieces to it that I don't like, but just yeah, let it be known that there is a very yeah. deep love of this film in my heart. Let it be known that this was one of the movies that I watched a million times when I was younger. And that is, this is a very formative movie for me. And I love this movie, the pieces and I have problems with it. There are things I have problems with this movie. That does not mean it's a bad movie far beyond it. I think this is possibly Jim Henson's best work as a director, his best Mm -hmm. director. And I think it is, it's a good movie. It's a very good movie. I don't think it's a great movie, but I still like it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, like, I, I would stand by that as well. Like, I I mean, if you go to my Twitter page, I'm sure you can see how, again, just how much love I have for this movie. And yet, if somebody were to ask me, you know, like, how would you actually rate it on a scale of 1 to 10? Well, well don't... don't- that away we, we we have it rated on a scale of one to five later in this episode oh gotcha well I, I guess just just to say it's like yeah like this this is not the best movie out there there are movies that would far outrank it it's there's just a certain quality about this movie that despite its flaws and despite it being goofy and cheesy it just it it makes me happy and it's a comfort movie where I I often cling to this movie when I'm going through weird, rough patches in my life. And I just want something that gives me that happy feeling of, you know, brings some nostalgia back. But it also inspires me to be creative and to just, I don't know, just gets me excited and energized. That's what this film does for me. I should say, speaking of rough patches, I've had a very odd day. Yeah. Um, I got a headache. I had a really nasty chocolate bar earlier. I broke my glasses. Oh, no. And when I went to go watch this movie, I couldn't find my copy of it. And I realized I left it at another location. So I had to rent this movie. (laughs) I had Or... $4.99 Four ninety nine or something like that to watch Labyrinth, a movie I've had on Blu-ray for maybe a decade. <laughs> I wish I wish, wish we lived near each other because I could have lent you one of my eight copies of this film. Eight copies? Yes. You wanna you wanna break that down real quick before you do? Do you have the laser disc? I don't have laser disc. No, unfortunately, I do have VHS for whatever that counts. Of course. I don't know if there is a laser disc of Labyrinth. There probably isn't. I, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. I think laser disc was still. Hold on. Hold on. All right. Google up. Give me a second. Okay. And then 
if you do find one, send me the link so I could buy it immediately after we talk. Okay. Oh my god. It it exists. Oh, perfect. You labyrinth laser you can get one for twenty bucks. Ooh. I might actually I was kinda joking earlier, but I might actually buy it for real. Like, or you can get one or you can get the Japanese version for eighty dollars. Oh. Labyrinth, by the way, if you didn't know, did very well in Japan. Okay. I, I know they had they had a video game for the NES that was made in Japan. Yeah, I and I believe there was a Labyrinth Expedition in Japan that was like a touring museum. Oh. A couple years ago. Years ago. Um also I just DM'd you the link to the, the eBay. <laughs> awesome, thank we'll you. It later. Um yeah, Labyrinth made like like nine million dollars in Japan and it only made thirty three world rides, so that tells mm. you how well it did in Japan. Yeah. I, I don't know why, but the people of Japan love Labyrinth. Yeah, something about it just appealed to them, I guess. Yeah. So what 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 in what mediums do you have Labyrinth eight times? Um, it's mostly it's just a mix of DVDs and Blu-rays, but it all started because I so that I mean that's this whole other story about how I rediscovered Labyrinth as a mid-teen. But the first DVD that I ever bought of it was just this very bare bones copy that only had the movie. And once I watched it and got this big love of Labyrinth, I, of course, had to buy the next DVD I saw that had all the special features. And then after that, they came out with a Blu-ray version. But then they came out with another Blu-ray that had even more special features. And I had kept the earlier copies because I'm just a sentimental person and I like it I, with them, you know yeah I, and it just kind of grew from there where all of a sudden I realized well now I have a labyrinth DVD collection and now I guess I have to continue it I mean I joke a little but I am the person who owns three copies of the Muppet movie so <laughs> for, for similar reasons yeah and I think, like, there are several hints in th- Like, I have two copies of Emma and Otter and two copies of The Great Muppet Caper. Just be... <laughs> well, and, like, with Emmett Otter, like, are they the different... Because there's the version with and then yeah. without Kermit. The reason I have two copies is because one has Kermit and one does not. Yeah. Yeah, that's the reason I have two copies of Emmett Otter. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean that's that's at least a little more sensible versus me who it's just it's just the same movie in ever increasing quality. Which you know what I mean, I'm not gonna sneer at, but please, please, you might be adding a nice laser disc to that collection. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Unless I snag that eBay listing before you do. Oh no. No, I'm oh. kidding. I'm I'm going to college. I don't have room for a laser disc of Labyrinth. Oh, good. <laughs> Um, sh- shall we dive into this movie? Sure. How, how we want, let's, um, let's start, bef- instead of tackling them as they come along, you want to just, like, tackle the songs at the beginning, like, right now? Yeah, sure. Um, Ad- there's not too many, there's less songs in this movie than I remember, but also, weirdly enough, more songs in this movie than I remember. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, this is my hot take. I don't like most of the music in this movie. <laughs> oh, my heart. With one very major exception. Yeah, which one which one's that? Dance. Dance magic dance. Dance, dance magic dance. Certified banger. Mhm. And I listen to that song and I let me rephrase. I love magic dance. I like underground. I don't remember any lyrics to the other two, and Chili Down is one of the worst songs I've ever heard. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't mind Chili Down. I do, if I remember right, there is, I think you could probably find it on YouTube, or at least you could back in the day. 
but there's an alternate version um, where I think Bowie sings it himself. And I remember liking that a bit better than the version that's in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, my favorite out of all the songs is Underground. And I don't know, that one just for me, it just, yeah, it, it just brings to mind like just, like the fantasy is about to unfold. And I just, I remember listening to that one so often <laughs> during my own university days. And, and I don't know, just something about it, just relaxing and yet energizing at the same time. It's like, I'm about to go on an adventure I, in an underground goblin city and no one's going to stop me. Like I say, I actually do like underground um, it's just as the world falls in and hold in that I, I don't have any opinion on whatsoever. I think I don't really have any thought. Underground, though, like you said, it's a really good opening to the movie. I think it really sets the tone and sets that magic. Like, it feels like you're about to embark on this grand adventure, which Labyrinth is. It is a grand adventure. Mm-hmm. The other thing I want to applaud this music movie for before is as much as I'm not love with the david bowie songs again i love magic dance underground is pretty good i absolutely love the trevor jones score yeah is fantastic i don't know if it's better than his score for the dark crystal i'm not a huge fan of the crystal as a movie but i think the score is like maybe the best part about it um i don't know which score is better that would have to be its own discussion for a different day but i still really love his score. He does this really great job of this fantasy synthy sound that he does. It's like he, he's just a really good composer. Mm-hmm. Good, not much to say about it, but I, I absolutely love the score to pieces. Yeah. I, I'm usually not a huge instrumental person. I usually just listen to music that has, you know, lyrics. Uh, but this is this is definitely the one exception where I will listen to the soundtrack from start to finish and the instrumental pieces, like I, I always think of Sarah's the the tune that accompanies Sarah, and again, it's just I don't know. It it just feels like you're off on this adventure, and it just I don't know. It just <laughs> makes me wish I was there. It's very good. It's very good music. Hmm. And it just it it it's this whimsical. And it's also very 80s, which I think works really well for this movie. Yeah. And it's just, it's very good. It's hard to talk about good things because they're good. Yeah. I, I've i used the soundtrack to amp myself up for job interviews. Like, I'll play it before I leave the house to go on this interview. Because it's like trying to get in that zone of just being happy and like, I'm ready. I can do this. Let's go. Yeah, we're going in a labyrinth. Yeah. Time to time to play the opening. T- I love that opening title so much. Yeah. And we're there. We're there. God, even for even with modern day CGI, that opening owl is just still amazing. Mm-hmm. Like that complex and that well done of a CGI character in 1986 is astonishing to me. Yeah. I think this movie gave me a huge appreciation for owls, uh, especially barn owls, of course. Mm-hmm. I actually, I got to, as a bucket list thing, I got to hold and pet a barn owl a few years for one of my birthdays. That's nice. I've never, I've never met an owl, sadly. Uh, you, you should give it a shot. Oh, trust me. Come, if the opportunity prevents itself, I will. I'm not going to run away from an owl. Yeah. They are uh, so soft. By the way, quick shout out to the Labyrinth Wiki, which I'm using for the uh, the plot detail as we're going through this. Because uh, the Labyrinth Wiki really breaks down every single thing that happens. So, thank you, Labyrinth Wiki. Also, I was today years old when I realized there's a Labyrinth Wiki. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's that um very good CGI owl, and then 
Okay, so I learned something today. I've seen this movie like six or seven times, right? Mm-hmm. I was today years old when I realized that Merlin is Ambrosius. Yeah. I didn't realize that. It's, it makes sense. Because this, yeah. is, I, I, I mean, it definitely has that, this Wizard of Oz quality to it. And it's like, you know exactly so there's there's so many especially in sarah's room that wonderful panning shot showing all of her toys and her mm-hmm. various collections it's basically it's telling you here's all the stuff you're going to see viewer there and here's all the stuff uh christy will recreate in 30 <laughs> yeah yeah exactly i definitely have so much fondness for that short little shot of all of her toys, and I, it left quite an impression because I had to make them all for myself. I do too, because I've actually years ago, as a um, as a treat. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, gotta get that water in me. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Uh, years ago, I had the pleasure of uh, seeing some of those artifacts and some other stuff in the movie in person. Um, they. Oh. At the, hmm. I'm so jealous. I I'm sorry. I don't. It sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm really trying. Oh no no. To, um, <clears throat> we flew down to see the Center of Puppetry Arts, and um, you know this this was a couple of years ago. This was like 2018, um, maybe 2017. One of those years, and I was very excited to see their whole Henson collection. This is in Atlanta, not the one in New York. Though I've been to both. Um, and just happened this was completely accidental we were there the same time they also had a special labyrinth exhibit Mm -hmm. so on top of all the other regular henson puppets they had a whole separate like giant room just full to the brim with labyrinth puppets and costumes and i got to see i got to see the pants (laughs) i got to see the david bowie pants and I talked to one of the museum people, and they had to make a special mannequin for it. Oh, God. Which is so, so funny. Oh. And so, so stupid. I, I've seen pictures of that exhibit, and I, I, I really hope that one day I can see some of those items in person. I, so I live in Canada, and I don't think we've ever, at, le- at least in as far as I know, I don't think we've ever really gotten a good Jim Henson exhibit like that, at least not in my neck of the woods. So I really got to try and make the trip down to the States one day just to, I don't know, just to behold them in person. I've spent so many hours staring at photos of some of those items to recreate them. So I, I'm very familiar with quite a few of the exhibitions that have been out there, but yeah, seeing it in person must have been amazing. Also, congratulations. We have our very first international guest on this podcast. Oh, woohoo! Woo! Yay, neighbors to the north. <laughs> America's hat. Actually, I assume. I don't think any of my other um, guests have been from outside the United States, but I have also haven't asked. So, <laughs> who knows? Maybe, maybe J.D. Hansel is secretly being in um, Australia this whole time. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, then we have um, Sarah running in the rain in her house, and she's I again I I think I noticed this like the I didn't notice this the first time I watched this this time, but I love how what she reads in the beginning comes back later. This mm-hmm. movie does such a good job of setup and payoff that honestly, if you if you don't know how to do setup and payoff this is a great movie to look at and kind of take notes on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very much a movie of, uh, you know, cause Sarah, Sarah's concocted this entire world. It, the world of the labyrinth exists because of her. And it's so fun to see all of these little details that just like these little things in her life that I guess Jareth, whatever being he is, pulls to create this fantasy world of hers. Yeah. And th- this is my other, my two major hot takes, I don't even know if they're hot takes, my two major hot takes 
in this movie is that I'm not a huge fan of all the music. And I really noticed this more this viewing than any other viewing. I I, I don't like Jennifer Connelly in this movie. No. I, no, I don't know what it is. I think I've seen too many critical reviews of this. And I think I think that's kind of ruined my perception at this point, if that makes sense. So is it is it her like is it Sarah as a character you don't like or is it specifically more, her her acting? No, I don't know if like it's her acting or if it's I don't know. She seems I was going to say she seems kind of like I the she's a teenager. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I guess it's mm-hmm. And you know, I'm technically I'm 18, but I'm still technically a teenager as well. Um I don't know. I guess it's just very wooden at times. I don't dislike Jennifer Connelly as an actress. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've seen her and I've only seen it once, but you know, she was pretty okay in that new Top Gun movie. Like she's not terrible. I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. I, you know what, thinking about it, I don't think I've seen much of her acting beyond Labyrinth. Neighbor of I, that's uh, not the only movie I've seen her in besides this one. I I've also seen her in <clears throat> Phenomena, which is a do, 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 do. phenomena. Do, but do, uh, do. it it was a, a horror movie that I think was filmed around the same time as Labyrinth because she By looks way, pretty much the same age. I'm sorry, I had to. <laughs> oh no worries. Uh and I, I no, she she. I think she gets better as the movie goes on. Mm-hmm. I think she is really good in that final scene, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Oh uh, yes, definitely. Her final confrontation with Jareth, not the big party dance at the end, which I don't. <laughs> yeah, think, and we'll also probably talk about. Yes, absolutely. I I do think like that was one of the criticisms that I recall was lobbied at this film and I mean still continues to be lobbied at it is that I, at the beginning Sarah is very she's bratty and she's kind of whiny and but I she's do supposed to be yeah exactly like you know she's a a, a teenager and she's wrapped up in her own little world and. It's just I I do like there's there's the moment where when Jareth shows up he has his big grand entrance and this is right after you know Sarah has just spent the all of the the screen time until that point just being a brat and being kind of mean to Toby and as soon as Jareth shows up I it's it's she kind of right away recognizes that uh oh like this is this is a trouble situation and mm. the brattiness you know subsides for at least a little bit and she's very just very straight laced and she's trying to just you know plead with this strange magic man that just showed up in her parents' bedroom um please just give me back my brother like I'm sorry I didn't mean it. Mm-hmm. She's very direct and to the point. And I do like her in that scene, except I, I, that scene is kind of ruined for me. How so? Because last week, I've mentioned J.D. Hansel a few times today. Mm-hmm. And as you know, J.D. ran an account called uh, the Bad Hansen Biopic. which you yep. And a part of that he released a few clips from what he called Labyrinth the Joe Raposo cut. Which was it, clips of Labyrinth recut to music by Sesame Street composer Joe Raposo. Oh no. And there's a version of this scene that he cut to the song Somebody Come and Play. Oh Somebody no. Come and play. <laughs> and there's like Muppets running around the whole time and at the end Jareth is replaced by Harvey Knee Slapper and it's it's kind of ruined my perception of this scene to me. Yeah. It's a very funny clip, but at the same time it kind of ruins the because it's supposed to be a very dramatic 
an intense scene and it kind of takes a lot of that out of it for me because all I can think of is somebody come and play today. (laughs) But you know, it's not terrible. No. Maybe he needs to he needs to do an entire Jeroposo cut of the movie so that you can purge it from your system. JD has got a million projects working on. He doesn't need another one. Oh, uh, add it to the list. Add it to the I know you're probably listening, JD. Add it to the list. Um to give him a quick shout out, I actually I just watched he did a wonderful uh video about Labyrinth. Yes, I've heard I've heard him talk about that. I haven't seen it. Um because I haven't been able to find it. But if you could DM me a link when we're done here, I would very much like to watch it. Yeah, we'll do. It just it came up on on YouTube and I finally got a chance to sit down and watch it last night and I in hindsight feel guilty because I I I took this one from him. He would have been a good guest, I think, for you to talk about Labyrinth with, I, but I forced him to listen to Kermit Unpigged instead, which is probably going to bite me in the in the butt one. Time. <laughs> next He's, if you to this, next time you're on the podcast, it's your choice. We'll cover whatever you want. God, he's going to make me watch something awful. Uh. Anyway, so Toby disappears, and then we get to go into the labyrinth! Mm. And we get to meet Brian Henson! Oh, good old Hoggle. The husband of the girlfriend from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I only just found out about that because it was something that JD pointed out in his in his labyrinth video. I found that up today while doing research for this podcast. <laughs> I was flabbergasted. And it's funny because her first husband was the son of Sean Connery. Oh. Yeah. Her two husbands are the sons of Sean Connery and Jim Henson. I I this world is wild. <laughs> but anyway, Hogwart! Hedgewart. It's Hoggle. <laughs> I also didn't know that Brian Henson did the voice of Hoggle until like a week ago. Oh, really? I mean, I. And what's the really funny thing is, I knew he did the animatronics. Like, I knew he was the one manipulating the face. I just never put together that he was doing the actual voice. It makes sense now to me, because Hoggle does sound a lot like the storyteller dog, which Brian Henson also did the performance of. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes sense, but I just never put two and two together. Hoggle is is such an interesting character to think about how they managed to pull him off. Yeah. Uh, as as you mentioned, Brian is performing the voice and all and puppeteering the face. Um, and then inside of the Hoggle costume, I'm blanking on her last name, unfortunately, oh, but her name first it, name was Shari. Shari Wessler. I yes, thank it, you. It will be good. Yeah, so she so she is in the costume and from what I remember from the behind the scenes stuff, like she could not see unless Hoggle's mouth was open. And so that's why Hoggle often gives these little grunts as he's walking, because it was the only way that they could open his mouth and and, and give her just a little peek of where she was going. Yeah. What was I going to say? My other thing about Hoggle is now, if you want to see Hoggle up close and personal, you know where you need to go. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need to go not to the Center for Puppetry Arts, not to mm-hmm. the, the Moving Image or your local museum that has a touring hands and exhibit. No, no, no. You need to go to the Lost Baggage Claim Museum. Mm-hmm. And I, is that Wisconsin? I feel like that's in Wisconsin. Oh, gosh, I'm not sure. Uh, the Lost Baggage Claim Museum is, it's, part of it is just a giant store where you can buy things that got lost in a baggage claim. Mm-hmm. And then the other half of it is, like, a museum with interesting things people left in baggage claim, including a hoggle puppet. Yeah, like, the full hoggle costume and the head, everything. 
And the reason, this is actually the reason I know about that Japanese exhibit, because that's when it got lost. It was oh. Japan, and it got lost in baggage claim. At least that's, if I'm remembering it correctly, that's what happened. Okay. Yeah, I, I remember hearing that it was it was some sort of promotional thing during the movie, and like that's why I like I forget the exact reasoning, but the Jim Henson Company, like they didn't, uh, they weren't able to try and retrieve it, or I don't know, just something happened where they weren't able to claim it, and as you said, it ended up at this this unclaimed baggage facility and a museum. Was in, very bad shape for oh, many, many years. And someone at, was hired to restore it and did not do the greatest job at it. Yeah, I, I listen, I say if you can, go to the Museum of the Moving Image, go to the Center for Tree of Arts. Do not bother going out to the Lost Baggage Claim Museum. Yeah. Which, I, I'm going to look up where it is. Hold on. Lost baggage claim. I don't know how to spell the word claim. Uh, <laughs> museum. Unclaimed baggage. The nation's top luggage store is in. Do, to do, they're going on a nationwide tour. Oh. Uh, they have an online shop. Um. Visit the store. Hold on. I gotta figure out where it is. Where is it? It is in... Alabama! Oh, okay. Because that makes sense. <laughs> so Hoggle's in Alabama for anybody that wants to go see how he's doing. Sweet Hoggle, Alabama! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so she meets Hoggle and Hoggle kills a bunch of fairies. <laughs> Poor He's so girl. happy. Yeah. Well, they did bite Sarah. Yeah. They're like mosquitoes. Um, and then you have that really nice, long um, which I don't really know how they did the shot of the long, never-ending labyrinth. Because I, I don't assume they built the set that big. I assume that's probably a matte painting. Yeah, there's a, from what I remember, there's a matte painting in the back, right. and there's like a section of long tunnel that they just, every time they would get to the end of it, they just would move the camera back, and then just shoot it again and kind of disguise the edit. Um, if you look, there's actually like a little line that goes through the path, and if I remember right, that's that's like part of the trail for the camera to sit in. Okay, so there, in the in the um in the cleaner sequence, which we'll talk about later, that line is very very visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's probably the rail for the the cleaner thing itself. Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, anyway, we'll get to that later. But so she's running through the corridor, and then we meet. I'll say my third favorite character in this movie: <laughs> the worm. The worm. The worm. I love the worm. You you and many other people, I think, I dare to say he, aside from Jareth, he may be the most popular character among fans. I, I, I kind of use the merchandise as a guide for that because I think the worm has appeared on way more merchandise than any other character. There's a worm plushie. I don't own it. I do own one labyrinth plushie of my favorite character. But I don't own the worm plushie. Mm. Uh, there is a worm plushie. I know with the Sarah Funko Pop, there was a worm that came with it. I have since <laughs> lost my worm. Oh, no. Because he's kind of small, and I don't know where he went. I think he fell off of a shelf, and now I don't know where it is. <laughs> one, one day, 20 years from now, you'll move and you'll find him. Yes, that's exactly what's going to happen. I'm not going to find this thing until we move out of this apartment <laughs> in like 20 years. And then I'll be like, what in the name? Oh, it's the worm. Also, I saw the puppet for this in that uh, touring, in that expedition I was talking about earlier. 
have any of the thrilly things on it? No, because, yeah, those are probably, yeah. like, rooted in later. And they were, like, ripped out. I don't know if they fell out or whatever. And he just kind of had, like, little white specks all over the head where the where the hair things should be. And it was really weird. Yeah, like, <laughs> just like a ball worm. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't pretty to look at. It's that's the shame with some of the props from the movies, you know, like the the characters especially is because the material that they were made with degrades over time, a lot of them are in rough shape. Yeah, a lot of them are. My other my other thing with the worm is that the worm purposely tell or the worm tells Sarah to go in the direction opposite to Jareth's castle. Do we mm-hmm. think Worm is scared of Jareth or working for Jareth? I I think I don't think he's working for Jareth. I think he just very innocently assumes that oh well she she doesn't want to go to the castle. Uh, like the castle's full of goblins and that bad guy. Like, no, go the other way. Like he's just be he's such a little helpful dude. I think he's just un, unintentionally uh, sending her on the incorrect path because he may be trying to protect her a little bit. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we completely skipped by another one of my favorite creature designs here. The eye thing. Oh, yes, the eye lichen. The eye lichen. Thank you. I didn't know what to call it. That is that is good. Oh, they're so creepy. I, I've thought about trying to make like a, 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 will, a plaque or something for my wall. So that it can make just a big batch of eye lichen and just hang them and creep out any guests. Man. Do it. <laughs> Do it. So then Sarah enters what I think of. When I think of the labyrinth in this movie, I think of this section of it. Um, not the, you know, you know what I'm trying to say here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And she does the thing with the lip sync. We guess the be- we get the best song in the movie. We get one of the best scenes of the movie. I love the constant cutting back to him playing with Toby because it actually seems like he likes Toby. Yeah, it's it's honestly it's very sweet in a weird way. It, it, you kind of forget that this is a bad man that kidnapped a baby because he just seems to be having a lot of fun playing with Toby. And I love all the goofy goblins, and I love the when he throws the baby up, and I I love all that. My, my one question with this scene, and with this kind of movie in general, um, that I've had, I think, since the first time I've seen it. Why are there so many chickens around? <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I... Do they are they pets? Are they planning to eat them? Because there's there's chickens all around all the goblin scenes in his castle, and then when we get to the big fight scene, there's just chickens all around the town. Yeah, chickens everywhere, and there there's like one single cat that you see ever yep. so briefly. I saw yes, I I I should have. That's the other thing. I tried to write notes for this movie, and I just I I, I kept forgetting to because I was just paying attention to the movie. <laughs> But there is the cat, so I don't know. The chickens is a weird thing. There's got to be some like deep meaning reading you could do into that. Maybe I I kind of wonder if it was just a practical thing of you know because if you have a live animal on set, it sort of adds like a bit of just an extra touch of movement and. But it sort also, of... you know how hard it is to work with animals on a film set. Yeah. Yeah. Like, why add that complex? The cat makes more sense because that's only there for like two seconds. There's chickens in like every shot of the of the goblin stuff. There, there's actually a great bit in the behind the scenes footage for this movie where Jim Henson himself talks about that because I think there's a it's an old Hollywood quote about you don't work with animals, or, or children, kids. or puppets. Oh yeah. And he comments that on this on you know on Labyrinth they did all three and as the scene in question I remember it very vividly because it's just Sarah and Hoggle and there's this chicken running around on stage and they they startle it and this chicken just goes flying up into the rafters and the camera pans up and here's this chicken just just sitting in the rafters I mean, on, on, over the movie set. 
the the Muppets always work with animals, children, and puppets. That's that's Robin the Frog in all three of those. <laughs> um, so we get done with magic dance, and then she encounters the four guards. Mm-hmm. We're all for now. Not these guys either. They're just really funny, and they're, they're it's a good scene. It's a good scene. I don't know what to say. Yeah, I I will admit. I've seen this movie so many times. I still do not understand how this puzzle works. Me neither. <laughs> I've seen this movie. I've seen this movie probably six or seven times. How many times do you think you've seen this movie? Oh gosh, I don't. I don't even know. Far, far too many. I think I. I've got majority of this movie memorized. memorized yeah, that, that's me with Caper with the Great Lump of Caper. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I don't know. There's not much to say about the guard scene. I really like those puppets. Those puppets are usually on display at the center, if you, if you ever go down. Um, mm-hmm. very, <clears throat> very nice puppets. Um, and then we get to the what I think is the creepiest part of this movie. Mm, the helping hands? Oh my god, that even nowadays, that still gives me the heebies. That this movie, I generally do not find creepy. I understand why some people would, but that scene in particular, oh, mm-hmm. no, 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 bad touch. It's it's wonderful. I think just how visual it is. Like it's, I, I just I don't know whoever whoever came up with that scene. I wish. I could shake their hand because it's just, They're, it's phenomenal. Shake their helping hands. Yes. But no. just how, how the faces, you know, their hands combine together to form the faces. Oh. It is like, as you said, it's very unsettling, but it's so cool. I love it. I love it. I think it's one, again, it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie, but I just, I think it's also the creepiest bar none. Yeah. Um. Then we got um down in the, Oubliette, which I, I'm looking up now because I have no idea what an oubliette is. The the oubliette? The oubliette. It's, yes, thanks. It's a place you put people when you want to forget about them. Yep. Um, so it's the dungeon, and then Hoggle is back, and he plans to take Sarah back to the beginning, but he starts to get friendly with her. That, that sounds wrong. That sounded stronger <laughs> than I meant to say it. Um... He she gives her the, the, the gives him the uh, the the bracelet. And he's, oh, this is fancy. What is it? Plastic. That's my favorite line. I think. Yeah, mm, plastic. Plastic. Um, and then we get to what I think is the funniest part of the movie when they're walking through that hall of faces, and Hoggle's like telling them all off, and then the one guy's like, "Oh come on, I never get to say it." Yeah. Oh, the false alarms. That That's another thing that I kind of wish I had the space for in my house. Just make a giant false alarm to sit in the corner. Do it! <laughs> Do it! I'm going to be the devil on the shoulder. Do it! <laughs> then we got uh, David Bowie. I think I'm Jareth. Why am I calling him David Bowie? Um, <laughs> he's in the disguise and then he says that... I don't know why he says nothing. Tra-la-la! Yeah. I... I have no idea either. It's a line that has baffled me for years. Be- and he has a certain inflection when he does it too. Tra-la-la. Nothing, nothing. Tra la la. It's really I mean, funny. It's just so confusing, though. It is. I mean, it's funny. I like it. Don't cut it, but like, <laughs> it's fun. Um, and then we get, I think, what's probably the second most disturbing scene in the movie with the cleaner. Mm hmm. Um, Really cool metal design. I like when it's revealed how it's being controlled. Um, yeah. Like, kind of railway car style. And I, I love to, you know, they've just gone through this big cobwebby filled cavern. And then you see the cleaners. And it's just, it's fun to get those shots of the whirling blades sucking up all of the cobwebs. And I don't know, it's just a great bit of world building because, you know, you, you have a series of underground tunnels well let's have a machine that periodically goes through and cleans them it's it's great i love i love the at the end of this scene too when they when they're climbing up 
and Hoggle's like, what, what, you know, what choice do you have to follow me? And they climb up to a pot that doesn't even touch the ground. Mm-hmm. I love that scene. It's, it's so funny. I've seen a lot of people assume that that's a movie goof, like a mistake. And it's so obviously intentional. Because, like, the whole thing in this labyrinth, I, we haven't really brought it up, but, like, it's constantly moving. It's constantly changing. Yeah. Eris trying to mess with you. And it's just, like, this is how... It's a wacky... Nothing makes sense in this movie. There yeah. is no such thing as a plot hole or a goof. Because you don't need to worry about continuity. This is, like, a movie creator's dream. <laughs> not having to worry about anything making sense and it'll make sense it remind i know we talked about the wizard of oz earlier but i think this is more ad uh, this is more a modern alice in wonderland than anything else yeah very true um then we get I, again i don't know if this is a hot take i think the worst part of this movie the the wise man yeah, I'm not. I, I I get bored a little bit. I don't. I don't mind him. I mean, it is after all of the action of the cleaners. It's a very, definitely a very quiet moment in comparison. I remembered a different moment. This is not the worst moment in this movie. Oh, okay. I I have an actual worst moment. No, this is fine. It's just a little boring. It's a little it come, after mm. the cleaners. I guess it is a nice calming moment, but yeah, I don't and know. They might- Managed to get Frank Oz in there. Yeah, it's it's really interesting looking at the it's a murderer's row of um, well known Muppet performers. You've got Karen Prell is in this movie. Um, Frank Oz does work. Noted uh, tiny mariachi band collector uh, Dave Golds is in this movie. <laughs> that I joke that like four people will get. Um, <laughs> Kevin Clash, Steve Whitmire. Um, who's a really nice guy, by the way. I met him in person. Great. That sounded like a brag again. I'm bad at doing... No, no, it's not. It's not a brag at all. It's awesome. Um, some very nice people in this movie. What's really... What's kind of a shame is that this whole week I'm doing a tribute to Jerry Nelson and he's not even in the thing we're covering on the podcast. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even... Oh, we should have done the Frog Prince. Uh, you know, I... if I... If I would have planned things better... Um, yeah, it's also, I was surprised Jerry Nelson wasn't in this at all. Um, I wonder, was there another production going on that he was tied up in? Sesame Street, I would assume. Oh, okay. There, for the record, Richard Hunt is also not working on this. So hmm. they, but like, I think of Kevin Clash as a Sesame Street performer too. Jim and Frank would always go and only do like a month in the when they got to the 80s they would do like one month of sesame street for the whole year where the other performers would be there more often oh okay i mean i guess i guess this was only this was a few years before elmo mania so i guess kevin wasn't too busy yet that makes sense i i know with frank oz he was only able to do the wise man because he was actually uh, while Labyrinth was in production, he was working on Little Shop of Horrors. So he's directing that. Another movie I have the poster on my wall. Oh, nice! I, I love Little Shop of Horrors. That both the musical and the movie. Yeah, uh, great. I, yeah, and that's Muppet adjacent enough. Maybe I'll cover that on the podcast one day. Oh, absolutely. Lisa Henson's in it. Who is she? Who did she play in it? She is um, one of the at the dentist scene. She is a patient in the dentist's office. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, so we get the wise men, and then we get first off, we get one of the weirdest things in this movie: the goblins with the Japanese accents. Did you, did you notice that? No. That the goblins um, poking. With the with the sticks with the biting, kind of had like Japanese accents. Oh, okay. I never really caught on to that. Yeah, that's uh, it's it's in, it's an, it's a choice. But yeah, I, we get my favorite character in this movie. Oh, the Ludo. Of, the of Ludo. Oh, Ludo down. 
<laughs> Ludo down. I love Ludo so much. I, or I'm sorry, we're mispronouncing his name. His name is Thog. Anyway, um, <laughs> again, another. That's not. That's that's not even an inside joke. That's just a Muppet Twitter joke. Yeah. There's a joke that people keep switching the names of Ludo and Thog. <laughs> really stupid. Um, Ludo, one of the very few Henson creatures to meet Princess Diana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is. Really? That's a weird sentence. It's just, those photos are amazing, and there, there's actually like video clips again in JD's video of Princess Diana meeting Ludo. She doesn't seem to know what to think of him. I mean, if you have never seen this movie before and you just saw Ludo on a red carpet premiere, and you're Princess Diana, I mean, <laughs> I love Ludo so much. And I love how they set up the rock thing. And how, yeah. like, they kind of hint at it when she's trying to defend him. Because you can see the rocks going to her. And, like, on a first watch, you might just think that's, you know, the labyrinth being the labyrinth. But on a second watch, you'll be able to see, oh, he's using his rock powers before they even establish it. And I love yeah. how, they up, how they tease it. He shows that he can do it, and then at the end, you've got that big finale. It's a really good, again, setup and payoff. Really mm-hmm. script. This movie is a really well written script. Absolutely. And I, I, I completely forgot to mention this. The script was written. It was, there are a couple of people who worked on it who are kind of uncredited. Jim Henson did some work on it. But the, the script was written primarily by Terry Jones. Mm-hmm. Of Monty Python fame. Yeah. Again, not so much anymore because I I got into it in middle school and then I kind of realized that some of it hasn't aged very well. But I used to be a huge Monty Python fan. Huge. Yeah. Monty Python is aged. Some of it like spoiled milk. Some of it like fine wine. <laughs> Um, but Terry Jones wrote the script to this. Um, and I also always forget that this movie was produced by George Lucas. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Well, and have you ever, um, so there is also the Labyrinth Commodore 64 game, and... I'm familiar with that it exists, but that's pretty much it. It was basically an adventure game where you're sort of retracing Sarah's path through the, the movie, and it was produced by by LucasArts. Ah, of course. It's um, actually, I, I would recommend it. I quite enjoy it. Hmm. So then, so Hoggle got scared and Hoggle ran off. And um, then Sarah goes to the forest. Ludo gets disappeared. We don't know where he goes. Eventually, we find out where he goes. And um, the Jareth goes... Um, tells Hoggle to give Sarah this peach or she'll go to the land of stench. And then he says, maybe my favorite line, um, there's a lot of great lines in this movie, but my favorite um, back and forth, um, which is, oh, Hoggle, if she kisses you, I'll make you a prince. Oh, really? The prince of the land of stench! (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I love it. And he's so pleased with himself for that one. And... He's, I love the stench. I know some people have criticized how stupid that is, but I love it. I think it's the perfect kind of stupid. And mm-hmm. a great setup and payoff, as we'll see later. Well, and, and also, too, I, I know I'm bringing in all of the Labyrinth universe stuff, but in the sequel manga series that came out in the early 2000s... Real quick, again, yep. Labyrinth, Japan loves this movie. Well, see, and the the manga was uh, a, an American produced one under uh, the Tokyo I, Pop uh, I, I, company. I've heard of an American produced manga? That's weird. Yeah, um, they, yeah. So it was an American artist and an American writer um, who did this series. But in that, I guess Jareth follows through on his threat to make Hoggle Prince of the Land of Stench because we see Jareth. As the prince of the bog, and he has a little clothespin on his nose, attending to his duties. <laughs> That's stupid. <laughs> okay, I, I I regret what I said earlier. This is my least favorite scene in the movie. 
Yeah. I don't like the Fireys. I don't like them one bit. I think their song is the worst song in the movie, as I said. I don't like their weird reggae accents. I think some of the comedy with them is good. Some of it is bad. A lot of the blue screen is bad. Mm-hmm. I, It's just hard for me to find positive things about this scene. Yeah, I don't I don't mind it. That might also just be I'm very used to this scene and the movie. I it does stand out quite a bit. And it's one of those scenes where I appreciate what they were going for and the experimentation they were doing with the like with the it it's actually it's technically it's like a black screen. It was this very dark black velvet that they puppeteered the fireys over and again like it's that's very cool and i like that they were experimenting with that technique but it does stand out quite a bit especially now as we're getting better and better quality versions of this movie it just stands out more and more what was what was kind of nice because i couldn't find my blu-ray I had to watch whatever quality the rent I had was, and it was a little lower than I was used to, so it wasn't as obvious. Yeah. Uh, which was kind of nice. The one thing that I do want to say that I kind of like about the scene, it actually creeped me out the most when I was younger, besides the helping hands, is the thing with the eyes. Yeah. When he puts his hand and he pokes them out and he rolls them like dice and then he swallows them and they're back in the sock. That creeped me out when I was young. Um, but I think it's a really cool effect and I think it's the best part of the scene. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> then Hoggle rescues her and um, set up and pay off. She kisses him, goes to the land of Eternal Stitch. Yeah. Straight into the bog. Well, almost anyways. And then they, they fall on Ludo, who I, I don't know why Ludo is there. I, I know why, <laughs> but I don't know. I do and I don't. I I do love how Ludo just disappears and reappears. I feel like it was probably a very practical thing they yeah. had to do with the movie where, know. you know, Ludo is a bit cumbersome and you kind of got to get him to go away for a little bit so that you can have an easier time filming Sarah and the Fireys and then come back to him once all of that's done. I also don't know what what Ludo would be doing during the fiery scene. <laughs> Just wandering around looking for Sarah. Yeah. Um, then we get my second favorite character in this movie. Hmm, Sir Didymus. Sir Didymus. I love this wacko <laughs> so much. Voiced, um, he was performed by Dave Goals, which is, I'm, I'm a massive Dave Goals fan. I think he is my um, favorite of the Muppeteers. That might be a hot take. I love Dave so much. Um, and I can tell he's performed by Dave Goals. I don't know why. Um, but he's voiced by David Shaughnessy, Brother to soap opera actor Charles Shaughnessy. Okay. Uh, I only mentioned that because I had just seen Charles Shaughnessy in a Disney Channel movie a week ago. Oh, which one was that? Uh, Mom's got a date with a vampire. From two- <laughs> oh, he plays awesome. the vampire. He's very <laughs> the brother of Sir Didymus. That's wonderful. Um, that that this is what is in my brain instead of the capital of Alaska, folks. <laughs> you know what? I'm not complaining. And you know what? Actually, actually, here's a question: Do, mm. do you know the capital of Alaska? No. Oh, or actually, Anchorage. It's Juno. Oh, okay. That's why. I ended that anyway. <laughs> I Anchorage is like I don't know. I'll have to look up why that name is notable to me because that's the only city in Alaska that comes to mind for me. Hold on. Now I got to make sure that's the capital of Alaska. Oh no. <laughs> no, it is Juno. Okay, we're good. Um so yeah, I like Sir Didymus a lot. I just think he's a really cool puppet. I think he's really feisty. I love his fight with Ludo. I think that's one of the funnier moments in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, well, he's also one of those characters where you know, kind of like the worm. Like Didymus doesn't 
mean any harm. He's nope. just a nice little dude who it's just going about his day when these randos come up to him and he's just trying to protect that bridge as best as he can and versus a lot of the other characters who are very adversarial to Sarah or Hoggle who keeps betraying her. Mm -hmm. And I also think Didymus is like so oblivious to everything else. He thinks he's this amazing knight in shining armor mm -hmm. and has this, I like to call it the dumb confidence where he's too dumb to realize he should be afraid. Yeah. Or yeah. I, I love that it's Ambrosius who's afraid. It's Ambrosius who runs away from battle. And of course, because Didymus is strapped to him in the saddle, <laughs> Didymus goes with him. I love him. First of all, I love Ambrosius and I can't believe it took me this long to realize they're the same dog from the beginning. <laughs> uh, Wizard of Oz style. But I don't know. I just, I love Ambrosius. Um, I love how he, I love how Sir Didymus, when they realize that his oath is that he just needs to give permission to them, and they ask. And I love that. Just like he's like very intense, and he's just like, yes, yeah. Like he's never this this possibility has never been brought up or considered, and he it's like rocked his entire world. Well, also, who has you think he's ever gotten company? Who has ever willingly went to the land of eternal stench? You know what? That's true. Has he <laughs> just been standing guard without any anyone else coming around? Oh, you, you think, <laughs> I feel bad for him. Do you think Jareth has pulled this scheme before with other girls? I. You know what? There's like a big fan theory that people have where. We're we're not quite there yet, but the 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 junk ladies that you see in, yeah. in the the junk the junk city, they I, people have suggested maybe those are other girls like Sarah who have failed in their attempt to cross the labyrinth. I've had that thought pop into my head. I don't know if I've ever theorized it, but it's popped in there while I've been watching. Yeah. I, I'm not so sure of it myself. I I don't know. I have I feel like the world of the labyrinth is so specific to Sarah that yeah. I have a hard time picturing other people in that exact same world. Well, I know somebody who has a very similar setup to Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have you uh, gone to a labyrinth before? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Maybe. I and I, you know, one day, again, if I ever get a bigger place and I have a room to completely take over, I, I feel like I, it's going to be so tempting to try and recreate Sarah's exact bedroom. And I feel like there's enough shots of it in this movie where you could theoretically do that. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. All right. So then, you know, uh, we get the peach. Sarah bites the forbidden fruit. Um, I don't know how to talk about this scene. <laughs> it's, I'll, I'll start by saying I find the song underwhelming, but I think the scene itself is really well shot and really well done. And yeah. I love Sarah's dress. And I love oh, yeah. the whole get up. And I love this. And I believe they, in like Los Angeles, San Francisco every year, people do this. Yeah, they actually, it was just held last weekend, uh, Labyrinth Masquerade, or I think it actually Masquerade of Jareth, I forget the official title, but yeah, they have a big old masquerade, and, and people dress up in these elaborate costumes, and it's wonderful, and I, uh, that's another thing I would love to do one day. These Labyrinth costumes? Oh, oh, I see what you did there. Eh? <laughs> uh <laughs> I don't have much to say about this scene except it's really well done. Again, like I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the song, but this is another just really solid scene. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's wonderful because it's Jareth trying whatever he can to try and entrap Sarah. Like nothing else has worked so far, so he tries to pull from her fantasies and nothing. You know, else make oh, good. No, 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 mine's a joke. You keep going. Okay. But yeah, he, he pulls from her fantasies and makes her 
the princess and and himself the prince and it's you know this this temptation and sarah who's in this awkward place in adolescence where she is becoming an adult woman but she's also still clinging to her childhood and i i think what stands out to me in this scene as an adult woman is that it's almost teaching her to beware of people like Jareth who who show up and want to wine and dine you, but who have nefarious intent. They're, you know, they're not doing this for the right reasons. And it's sort of a warning that like Sarah gets a little too close and it frightens her. And she's not quite ready for that kind of attention and Jareth's attention and all of the people in the ballroom leering at her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so for Jareth, nothing else works, so let's just put her in a music video. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I have music videos on the brain, because on top of watching Labyrinth, another thing I've been doing this week is my annual tradition of torturing myself by watching every video nominated for this year's VMAs. Oh, interesting. It's That's a whole podcast in its own. Yeah. But, I don't know. I really like this 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 part of the movie, and I also really like the take of this movie as a metaphor of Sarah becoming an adult. I mm-hmm. love that take a lot. I don't know who came up with it. I've heard it a few times before. I don't remember the first time I heard it, but I do really like that this is Sarah entering entering into womanhood, and I don't know. I just think it's a really interesting and well interesting take of this movie. Yeah, it's it's funny because when I when I first got into Labyrinth, I was around the age of Sarah and I definitely kind of bought into Jareth a bit. You know, like he's just so cool and oh like he's big. Yeah, like I <laughs> I like I you know, like you just think like, oh Sarah should have stayed with Jareth, he's just awesome. But then you get older and again you kind of realize who Jareth really is and what, you know, again, he's, he just wants to win over Sarah. He doesn't actually love her. And I, I just love that as I've grown older, that this film has become deeper. Mm -hmm. Speaking about going deeper, that was a terrible transition. Um, (laughs) My, my, my other the reason I made the Alice in Wonderland connection specifically is all the falling Sarah does in this movie. Mm-hmm. A lot of Alice in Wonderland. Specifically, the Muppet Show episode of Alice in Wonderland. Oh, yeah. Which got me thinking, if the Muppet Show was still on in 86, you know they would do a Labyrinth tie-in with Jennifer Connelly and or David Bowie as the guest. Well, I know they did. There was an episode of the Muppet Babies that they yeah. did all about Labyrinth. Yes, there is, with Gonzo as Hoggle. Yeah. There is also a um, Muppet Magazine cover, which I actually posted a clip, uh, an image of a couple of weeks ago, of Kermit the Frog with Sarah in this ballroom outfit. And yeah. It's very, it's very good. That issue also has a couple pages of Bunsen Honeydew at the beach. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> like a, a pin-up thing, or...? No, God, no! Don't put that. <laughs> in <your pants. laughs> I had to know. No, it was like um, doing experiments. Like it was his log of like the things he did. Okay. Uh, putting things in people's head. Anyway, then we get to my, I'd say least favorite character in this movie, the junk lady. <laughs> you don't like her? I find her weird. I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, you know what? As, as an aging collector of various things, I relate so much to the junk lady. <laughs> you know, currently currently surrounded by piles of my own trash. I mean, who who can't relate? What what trash? I've only got a million <laughs> bottles around here. Me and my eight copies of Labyrinth, all very <laughs> necessary. <laughs> No, I don't hate. I don't hate any character in this movie. Um, um, so we had the junk lady. I liked. I kind. I don't know. I like some of it. I like how Sarah's room crumbles at the end. Mm-hmm. I like how Didymus and Ludo are just there. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> just right when she needs them. Right when, ah, uh, ah. Uh, in you, you know what's funny? In an earlier version of the script, apparently during this scene, Hoggle was going to be drowning his sorrows at a at a bar. Now I want to see that. I want to see. Yeah. That. I want to see that cut. <laughs> Forget the Schneider cut. Release the Hoggle gets drunk cut. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Um. So I will. I. I feel like we. I have to point out in in that scene of Sarah breaking the 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 junk lady's illusion. You know, she gets handed the music box, and the Sarah's music box is probably the most sought-after prop replica of fans of this film. And I say that because I have made one, and I very regularly get people messaging me asking if I could make them one as well. And so as a result, every time I watch the scene, the moment where Sarah throws the the music box and says it's all junk it kind of it makes my heart do a weird little oh like no sarah it's so precious you have no idea how many people want that um it's also to do, do, do very expensive to buy one of those actually i'm on ebay i can't even find a good one yeah they've never released an official version so the only ones out there are fan recreations and that's that's something that surprised me i would have thought that for one of these major anniversaries of the film they would have come out with their own official one and like they've they've done a lot of um stuff over the years like there's a lot of merchandise for this movie you can buy a lot of oh excuse me Oh, excuse me. Like I said, I had a bad chocolate bar earlier. Um, <laughs> I bought a novelty chocolate bar. It was it was wa- chicken and waffles. It was really oh. <laughs> chicken. Oh my god! Half of that sounds like a good candy bar. A waffle candy bar sounds amazing. <laughs> chicken. There, I read the ingredients. There was chicken stock in the candy bar. Oh no! Why would you? Why would you do that to yourself? And it was four dollars. Oh, why would you do that? For the record, a, a, a family member bought it for me, but still. <laughs> anyway, I I want that music box too. It's very nice. I don't know why they don't do more recreations because I know at some point didn't they put out. A fiery that looks like the fiery in the movie, or something like that. I don't. They so they have fiery plush toys, but they aren't the same as the one that Sarah has right. in in her room. Right. I I feel like they released. You gotta release something. You gotta release that statue of Jareth, or you, you gotta do it at some point. I don't know why they haven't. I yeah, it's. I mean that's all that's all the stuff that I got tired of waiting for them to make their own version and so that's why I made yeah. my own. Shout out again. I mean we'll do plugs at the end. Um so then she gets rescued from the trash pit. Um they go to the goblin city and they fight that like, ginormous humongous, yeah. humongous giant goblin robot controlled by that little guy. Literally, yeah, literally named Humongous, and I love Humongous so much. Just the spectacle of this fifteen-foot-tall <laughs> robot goblin creature. I love how he, um, I love how he he comes out of like the 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 um the doorway, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, the doors close, and and it he's like the two halves of the door. Yeah, it's a really cool. I don't want to. I was gonna call it a puppet. I don't know if it's it's not really a puppet, but it's really cool. Hmm. Um, so Hoggle saves they, and Ambrosius is really scared, and then they walk into a deserted goblin city. Yeah. Except for the cat. Yeah, the cat, the one little cat runs past. And a couple chickens, like we mentioned earlier, and they have that one goblin who's like, boss, boss, they're here! (laughs) Yeah, I guess Jareth was so certain that she would get stuck in the junkyard for forever that he stopped keeping tabs on her. It's like, remember the girl who who forgot everything? 
<laughs> well, she's here. I know I said I had my problems with it, and I do, but I love this movie so much. <laughs> Um, and then they have that excellent, excellent battle scene. Ambrosius is nervous. Sir Didymus is overconfident. Ludo calls in the rocks at the end. They've got all those cool goblin puppets, including the one scene you can see somebody's head. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I think, is it, is, is it actually a puppeteer's head that you can see poking out? Yeah, in the um, in the scene when they're first lifting them all up. Um, and they're all around the uh, the top of the castles. You can see somebody's head in one of those shots. Oh, I'm going to have to go back and look for that. And I want to say it's Dave Gold. <laughs> I think. I you, We laugh. You can see heads in practically every season one episode of The Muppet Show. It's not, it's not rare. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, and honestly, for the amount of puppeteers that this movie had... If they get one head in the shot, that's probably, like, dozens and dozens of others that you don't see. So still kudos to them. Kudos. I mean, it's a big... Also, they might have not noticed, because film wasn't as clear back then. Mm -hmm. So, eh, who knows? So then they have the big fight. I love that fight. I love all the rocks. I, lo I, like, I like this movie. Yeah, I just, I love the utter chaos that's caused by all the rocks the utter chaos then we get the um the really sweet well if you need us yeah should you need us should you need us i don't understand where the i have to face him alone thing came from i i think it's just it's sarah you know living like whole, yep. yeah it, it's just or, part I, of the fantasy <clears throat> and then we get I don't want to call it the MC Escher room, but they literally call it the Escher room on the Wikipedia page. Yeah. So the room clearly inspired by the paintings of MC Escher. Is yeah, it? I, I think it's MC, right? Yes. Yeah. Not I, I love this room so much. I wish I could live in it. You know what would be cool? The MC Hammer room. <laughs> oh, God. I don't think I have the fashion sense for that. Yeah, it's all just parachute pants and really loud yellow jackets. Yeah, I don't think I could pull it off. No, I love I love the design. And again, I love how you don't have to follow continuity because it's not supposed to make sense. <laughs> and um, I don't know. I just this song hold hold in. I always call it hold on. It's it's hold in. Uh, with within you. Oh, within you. I'm so. St I don't know. That's how that's how much I know this song. <laughs> um, I think it's a perfectly fine song. Um, I like this MC Escher scene. I love Toby on the edge. I love Toby, by the way. Shout out to Toby. Yeah, we haven't really mentioned uh, Toby Froud at all. We haven't even mentioned Brian Froud at all. Oh no, that's even worse. Uh, Brian Froud did most of the. Um, I say most, but probably all of the design. If you haven't picked up the Labyrinth um, visual guide, they do they put one out for their crystal, they put one out for Fraggle Rock, there's one for Labyrinth. I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a coffee table book, and it's just full of concept art and beautiful drawings of Brian Froud's characters. Uh, Brian Frown, known sometimes as the sexy Miss Piggy guy, shout out to Commitment. Um, he's a <laughs> great, great uh, Muppet designer. Um, and I, I don't know what to say about him except, man, keep doing what you're doing. He's still yeah. alive, right? I think he's still alive. Yeah, he, he is. I I would really love to meet him one day. I'm actually, I, I'm still bitter because years ago he was slated to attend a my local convention. And uh, he and Wendy were going to come and had to cancel and they've they haven't been able to come back or the, the convention hasn't invited them back. And I'm just oh like I would just love to meet them and be able to get a signed print of some of his artwork. Man, it, meeting Brian Froud would be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then we get Jareth's last stand. I love the white costume. I love the white costume. Oh, and you know who also we haven't um shouted out? Who? We should shout out. Michael Motion. Oh, yes, yes. So the man behind Jareth. Because 
I'm sorry to break the magic of, of the movies. David Bowie couldn't actually do all that juggling and all that that magic balls. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I got to see those balls. <laughs> Everybody, I saw David Bowie's balls. That sounds so much worse. <laughs> But I got to see the crystal balls again as part of that exhibit I was talking about earlier. And Michael Motion was the juggler they bought in to basically puppeteer David Bowie's hands. So any shot where he's doing the stuff with the crystal balls, those aren't his actual hands. That's Michael Mo- Motion, who I mm-hmm. hope we're pronouncing right. And he and it's again, I I've mentioned it a few times, but the behind the scenes footage of uh, Labyrinth, I think it's specifically it's the making of documentary that you could find on some of the DVDs it's so it's so interesting because he's like he's like crammed right up against David Bowie's back and, and is slinging his arms around him and, and of course they use Jareth costumes, the, the flowing capes often to hide mm-hmm. Bowie's real arms and he was doing all of that juggling in that with Without being able to see what he was doing. Yeah. Michael Motion, that's the guy I want to meet. I, is he, oh, no, now I got to see if he's still alive. <laughs> Hold on. He is. According to the uh, Labyrinth Wiki, he is. Awesome. Um, he's born in Massachusetts. And I, no, we're not doing this whole thing. Um <laughs> I don't know. I love. I yeah. The 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 crystal ball juggling is great. Jarrus white outfit is great. And then this is where I think Jennifer Connelly shines. This speech. This whole back and forth. Um, some of the dialogue I don't get. You know, love me, submit to me, let me control you. I'm not, I'm I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. Just, like, just love, fear me, love me, do as I say, and I will be your slave. That's not how that works. <laughs> nope, but it's it's just him right. saying whatever to try and convince her. Just let I just want to win. Like he, it's just a game that he has been playing against her, and he knows he's losing. So he's doing this last ditch thing just to try and his, squeak in a win at the end. His lab, no, there's I, there's a pun there. If I tried a last <laughs> ditch in labyrinth, but it doesn't work. <laughs> um, and then. I, again, I love the callback or the setup and payoff. How, again, just like in the beginning of the movie, she forgets what she's supposed to say. And then the, just the punch, the the final nail in the coffin. You have, you no, have no power over me. I love that. I love that line. And then everything starts to crumble down. And he starts to explode. I... <laughs> and I the one thing I don't like, I don't like this kind of slow mo. Like, I don't. It just is like not just in this movie. I don't like that kind of slow mo in any movie, really. Yeah. Um, it's just a stylized personal thing, I guess. But I don't know. It's a, it's a great finale. Mm-hmm. <laughs> finale. And, and it's so triumphant. Her win. She's back in her house along with a very poorly uh, green screen barn owl. <laughs> That's worse than the fire. Yeah, it's a little it's a little rough again, especially with how high quality the the, the the copies of the movie are now. But this movie was from 1986. I'm allowed to give it some slack, but also make fun of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's you we poke fun, <laughs> but in a very, very loving way. Right. Um Oh boy! Oh no, no, no! So then she runs back upstairs to look on Toby. Stole that from the wiki. Uh, and she's there, perfectly fine. Then we have uh, her parents come home. She starts to put some of their stuff away, and then there's the mirror scene. Mm-hmm. So good, so good. <laughs> um, and then I think it's a metaphor is how like it's okay to move away from childhood. But it's also okay to go back to childish things if you need them. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I think Sarah's problem in the beginning of the film is that she was relying on the childish things too much. Right. It's okay to rely on childish things in the tough times or when you just need to pick me up. But you shouldn't surround yourself. I say this in a room full of Muppet memorabilia. You should <laughs> 
completely rely on childish ideals to get through life. You need a balance of an adult and child. Mm -hmm. And I do find it funny how, you know, she's like, I do need you. And Hoggle's like, why didn't you say so? And they do the weird party scene. Yeah. With... They're, they're they're all in party hats, and Sir Dynamis has an oversized crown on his head, and also the the wise man, too fair. <laughs> several of the goblins who kidnapped her brother are there. Yeah, I, I love the wise man. He picks up the fiery plush toy in Sarah's room and just starts swinging it around. <laughs> I didn't notice that, but that sounds. <laughs> I just oh god, I think I think still the movie rented. I can I can look up. <laughs> Twenty four hours. I don't know. Yeah, the big party ending, I'm not I'm not a fan of it. I think it's a weird way to end the film. I I don't know. Like it's just hard to know how to interpret it because is it actually like have all of the labyrinth creatures physically appeared in Sarah's room because before it felt like before the labyrinth stuff can feel like a dream or an imagination cuz mm. I guess there are some, like, goblin creatures in the parents' room at the beginning, but I feel like even that is, like, the start of the... Because Jareth's there. Like, David Bowie, Jareth, not just the owl. So I think... I don't know. It... Yeah. We're almost towards the end. It, it... This is a good movie. This is a good movie. It is. But this ending makes no sense. I kind of wish... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's it's hard because I, I don't really have an alternative to propose, you know? Like, it, it is nice how you get to see everybody one last time and, and they, they're they there to celebrate with Sarah because she... She won. You know, she, yeah, she won. And she oh. didn't really... We didn't really get to see oh. the, you know, Ludo and everybody else's reaction to her winning. So... Oh, my God. So the pop culture brain that I have just, just thought of something terrible. Yeah. Are you familiar with the anime Evangelion? Not very. There's a very... I'm not very familiar with it either. But there's a very iconic meme of the end of Evangelion with just all the characters clapping going, Congratulations! 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 And all I can now think of is a labyrinth version of that. <laughs> with just all the different characters going, Congratulations! Like, Hog was like, congratulations! That was a terrible Hoggle. <laughs> but, like, that's all I can think of now. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'll have to look that up so I can picture it better. Yeah. Uh, Jareth Owl flies off, and that's the credits! That's it! You know what? A two-hour discussion on Labyrinth is much better than a two-hour discussion on Kermit Unpigged. I'll tell you that. Yeah, well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad it was an enjoyable uh, time. No, I mean I enjoyed my chat with JD, but I have to say, Labyrinth is much is a much better product. Than mm -hmm. Um. So overall, what are your thoughts on Labyrinth? Now that we've discussed it. Oh, I mean, it's just again, it's just such a comfort to me. It's just if I need to pick me up, I can put the movie in and watch it, and I feel better. Or if I need something to do, I. I go and I see, like, what can I make from Labyrinth? And what, you know, what what new skill can I teach myself w along the way? It's just, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how this movie became so important to me or why exactly, but it but it has. So I, I will say it, thank you so much for having me because oh. I rarely get a chance to talk about Labyrinth. And this was such a fun opportunity to gush about it for a couple hours. Maybe what this maybe that's what this podcast just becomes, letting different people come on here and talk about labyrinth. <laughs> Who would be fun? I, mean, um, I would I would be willing to come on again and just keep talking about labyrinth. There's so much more I could probably say. I know there's so much more, so I'm gonna let just think of one more thing you would like to say about anything in this movie that we haven't already discussed. Oh my goodness. Because <sighs> the one I, I want to bring up that we didn't mention and I completely, we completely forgot to mention. I love the stupid goblins being like, "Say it, say it." Oh no! Oh, yes. 
right. Yeah, the, like the wall, the <laughs> wall of goblins. He didn't mention the wall of goblins. We kind of skipped past it, and I just wanted to shout out the wall of goblins. I love that. <laughs> Those guys. Oh, I mean, just all of the goblins in general. They're so fun. I love how doofy they are, and Jareth is just so sick of them. I'm also so sad this movie was a flop at the box office. Yeah, it's... I, like, it must have been so disheartening for Jim Henson because so much work went into this movie and and for it to flop, you know, like, I, I wish that he could have seen how beloved it's become. Mm-hmm. So, as you listeners may know, we rate things on a scale of 0.5 to 5 Kermits. With 0.5 Kermits being something unanimously described as bad, like, um, I, I'm trying to think of a bad Muppet thing. Uh, the, uh, the, the, something bad. Uh, your your favorite Muppet thing, right? That's a 0.5. Mm-hmm. And a 5 is something unanimously agreed upon as good, like the concept of Frank Oz. <laughs> Um, so if you had to rate Labyrinth from 0.5 to 5 Kermits, I probably don't even ask, what would you give it? I mean, I would have to give it a full 5 Kermits. My personal preference, at least. I'm going to go one notch down. I'm going to give it 4.5 Kermits. Which is yeah, totally high. fair. And I think it's the highest I've ever rated anything on this podcast. Ooh. I think Labyrinth is the best thing we covered on this podcast. Wait, I haven't had too many episodes where we've covered stuff. You know, one of those episodes was on Kermit Unpigged. <laughs> Another episode was on John Denver and the Muppets Christmas Together, which is only kind of good. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one of those episodes was on the John Cleese episode of the Muppet Show, which I have it was that was probably the best thing up to this point. And then the other episode was on Muppets from Space, which is a much worse movie than this. Oh gosh. I don't hate Muppets from Space. Listen to that episode if you want my opinions. Um but uh Christy, thank you so much for being on the show. No problem. Again, thank you so much for having me. No problem. Um you got anything to plug? Um if anything, I'll just plug my Twitter and Instagram where I am KO Makes Things. If you want to see me make random prop repl- replicas from Labyrinth mostly and, you know, other stuff, I do Disney stuff as well, whatever strikes my fancy, really. Uh, but that's where I post pictures of the stuff I make and also some of my, yeah, my drawings. I've been having a lot of fun doing Disney Muppet crossovers, usually an excuse just to draw Miss Piggy as a Disney princess. They are great. Uh, as for me, this is the final episode of season one of Live from Muppet Land. Uh, I start college in just a couple days, and I will not have time for this show anymore, sadly. This show is not going on... We're not ending. This is not the series finale. Um, I Possibly episode around Thanksgiving, maybe... Who knows? It's not that I won't have time. It's just, I don't know what my roommate's life's going to be like. It's a lot harder to find a quiet place in a college dorm than it is my own house. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, so maybe an episode around Thanksgiving at the Stars Can Align. Definitely an episode or two around December, January. Probably, probably expect, hope for an episode around Thanksgiving. Expect an episode of, of a preview for the Muppet Twitter Awards and expect an episode after the Muppet Twitter Awards. But other than that, probably not a full batch of episodes until sometime in May or June of next year when I have <laughs> more free time in the summer. Uh, so yeah, uh, you can follow this account. Shout out to Jerry Nelson, who passed away uh, 10 years ago this week. Uh, miss your buddy. Never met Jerry, but I, I'm sure we all wish we could meet him and give him a big hug. Um <laughs> Yeah, follow this account. I have an Instagram. I don't use it. Um, my last episode uh, where I talked to J.D. Hansel, we mentioned several times in this uh, episode, is on YouTube. Give it a watch, as is all pr- all the other previous episodes of this podcast. Give them a listen, along with some other projects I worked on. This is my last chance to plug things for a while, so I'm going to plug everything. Watch last year's Muppet Twitter Awards. Last, watch last year's Muppet Fan Hall of Fame. 
watch the video I did with Tub Pigs where Joe Hennis and I ate terrible sandwiches. <laughs> that was disgusting. Don't do that, Christy. <laughs> Listen to me. Do not eat the sandwich from Muppets from Space. I don't know why I did. I still blame Lucas Ross. You, uh, you ate that sandwich and then you also ate the chicken and waffles chocolate. So I think you, you keep doing this to yourself. I have issues that we need to work out. That's <laughs> what we're all realizing. Well, Christy, thank you again so, 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 so much for being on this podcast. I really appreciate it. And thank you, the listeners, for making this a great success, this podcast, and a great first season. Might be back in Thanksgiving. I hope to be back sometime in December. And let's play us out! Woo! Woo! Woo!